Good morning. I'm going to say welcome. I'm going to ask you guys to come on in and have a seat. As we get started this morning. Got this wonderful instrumental music. Thank you, Bob, for doing that. Appreciate that. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, as we get going this morning, um, I'll, Bob's figuring out and getting the music off for us. Um, as we get going this morning, first of all, again, I just want to welcome those of you who are here with us in person. Also want to welcome those of you who are joining us on Facebook Live. Uh, it is good to be together uh, again. And so a few announcements as we get started. Um, first of all, uh, we are working, ooh, that was loud. Uh, we are working on putting together a new church directory. And so if you did not get one of the directory forms last week, or if you got it and you're like, oh, I have no idea where it is, no problem. We have more in the back. Uh, it's actually in the basket in the back there. Um, so you can grab one of the forms. If you prefer to fill it out online, grab one of the forms and just put in the URL that's on the top of the front and you can just fill it out online instead of by hand. Uh, if you have filled it out, you can just put it in the offering basket. Um, there's no, uh, I mean, there is a little bit of a rush, but it's not like you have to get it done today. So uh, no rush in that sense, but uh, we will do that. We also will be making a photo directory, but we're going to have uh, an in-house photographer do that. That'll be coming up, so we'll let you know and uh, when to do that. Uh, we have Sunday school meeting at 945 and we meet in the back corner classroom and we just started this morning a new study called The Cost of Control, um, a study led by Sharon Hottie Miller and we actually have in the library uh, her book that this study is based on. The book is titled The Cost of Control and so if you are interested in checking that out that will be in the library and you can check that out and and read her book as well. Um, also, want to make sure that everyone knows and everyone is invited immediately after the service today uh, to the fellowship hall where we will be having our birthday celebration for all of our January birthdays. And so Nelda has put this together and uh, along with some help from others. And um, so please join us everyone um, after service in the fellowship hall for that. Also, there is prayer meeting this Wednesday at uh, 1.30 in my office. So if you are available, um, I'd love to have you join me for prayer on Wednesday. And men's group, we are also meeting this Friday, February 3rd, um, at Joe DeLeon's house from 8 to 9 a.m. And we will be finishing, most likely, uh, the end of Matthew. We're reading Matthew chapter 28 this week. And uh, that is the very end of the Gospel of Matthew. And we will be moving on to reading and discussing the book of Hebrews. So guys, we'd love to have you join us for that. Just a reminder again too, um, our offering plate is in the back by the door before you leave. And uh, it is again a joy to be together, to worship together, to learn together, and uh, to pray together. And so... Right now, if you would all stand with me, we will join in our worship singing.
you may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. And hello to you guys online. Good morning. So our scripture comes to us this morning from James uh, 3, 9. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who, has been, who have been made in God's likeness. So James also talks about, I'll put all this stuff over here. James also talks about a little earlier that the tongue is like a horse, right? That has a, well, it's really like a bridle, right? It's like a small part here. Let me give that to you. There you go. Thank you. So this is like a small part of the horsey, right? The bridle, and it tells it which way to go, right? Or our tongues can also be like the rudder of a ship. This is Magali and Miley's ship with their rock star captain that's on there. And... The rudder tells that the captain turns the wheel and then the rudder says which way the ship is supposed to go, right? So our tongue is compared to um, a ship and a bridle on a horse, and it's also compared to a little flame. So if we like this, right? It's a little flame, and the words we say, they come out of our mouth, it's quick, swoop, and then before you know it, they're gone, just like this little flame is burning. But as our firefighters in our um, congregation here can tell us, um, a fire can woo. A fire can be started. <laughs> Don't worry, it's out, firefighters. Okay, a fire can be started by those quick words, right? Like a forest fire can be started by that little quick flame, right? And it's out of our mouths before we can do anything about it. And the Bible says that our mouths, um, it doesn't have a lot of good stuff to say about our tongues because they can get out of control. I don't know about you kids, but I have been struggling with my tongue all weekend. In fact, yesterday, Pastor Ryan and I got into um, a discussion, and then I said that I would try 24 hours without fussing at him. Um, 8 a.m. this morning, I was fussing at him, so that didn't even go 24 hours without fussing at Ryan. Whoops, so try again. <laughs> so what do we do when we find that the words that are coming out of our mouth are not pleasing to God, right? Well, first we have to recognize that the people that we're talking to are made in God's image and likeness. They actually bear the image of God. And so we're talking to our brothers and sisters who are driven us a little crazy or uh, other people, right? The words that we say, we're saying to, to them, to the image bearers of God. Another thing we can do is say we're sorry because we say things that are hurtful and painful to other people, right? And when we become aware that those hurt people's feelings, let's say we're sorry and ask them to forgive us, okay? So let's be thoughtful about our tongues and the way they can light up like a flame or steer a rudder of a ship or control a horse with its bridle um, and ask Jesus to help us to have our tongues be praising him and not tearing other people down. Okay, let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we praise you and thank you that you made our whole selves to honor and glorify you. And we know that sometimes our tongues get away from us. And so we just ask you this morning, we give our whole bodies to you and pray that you'll teach us and direct us about how to speak to each other and one another in love and in mercy and grace. And when we don't, because we won't all the time, that we'll say we're sorry and um, ask for forgiveness. You know, we pray, amen. Thank you for that. At this time, we have the opportunity to go before God in prayer as a congregation. And I want to invite you and encourage you during this time, if you feel comfortable, to pray a prayer out loud. And if you're not comfortable praying out loud, no problem. I want to encourage you to pray silently. And if you're joining us this morning and you feel like, I don't know what to pray or, or even how to pray, again, no problem because Scripture tells us that the Spirit will pray on our behalf. So let's go before God as a congregation in prayer. Lord, we do again thank you for this morning and the chance to be together. Lord, the chance to worship you, to praise you through song, through study, through prayer, through fellowship. Lord, through being silent and just listening to your still small voice as you teach us, as you guide us. Lord, we uh, just give you praise at the chance to be together. Lord, we give you praise that you give us so many blessings. Oftentimes we even just, we look over them or look past them each and every day. And Lord, we thank you that you are faithful, that you don't give up on us. You don't reach a point where you say, boy, 
they're not acknowledging my blessing, so I'm done giving it to them. That you continue to just bestow upon us blessing after blessing after blessing. Lord, we thank you that you, because of Jesus Christ and our faith in him, that you are our heavenly Father. And Lord, that you invite us, you encourage us to come to you directly with our prayers, our prayers of request, also our prayers of thanksgiving, our prayers of praise. And so Lord, hear us now as we lift those prayers to you as a congregation. Lord, we lift up to you those um, who are not feeling well, who are struggling with illness. And Lord, we just pray for your hand of healing upon them. Uh, during this time of illness, we pray for your hand of comfort. Lord, for those who are traveling, we do pray for safety in their travel as, as the weather um, is cold and icy. And uh, whether it's traveling locally or, or uh, further away. Lord, we continue to lift up those who are away uh, serving on mission trips right now. And just pray that you be with them and guide them. Um, use them to bring others to a saving knowledge of you. And Lord, we thank you and praise you for that. And Lord, again, we just pray that you would open our ears and our hearts and our minds this morning to hear from you what it is that you want to say to us today. And in all that we do, all that we are, both individually as well as the congregation, Lord, may you be glorified. We lift this to you now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, children, you are dismissed to our children's church. And as they're heading out, we will get ready for our overhead prayer and scripture reading. Okay, please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, in our scripture reading is Revelation 5, 12 to 13. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And if you would stand, we will continue with our worship singing.
afraid to see them. Hey, Bob, could I get you to press the little black screen for me to black out the projector? Perfect, thank you. We are continuing our study in Luke, and today we uh, move to the next verse, Luke chapter 11, verse 4. So I want to invite you to open to that. We're actually going to just take the first part of that verse this morning. And the sermon title today is Four Words and His Signature. Well, this week I actually typed into the Google search bar the words, How to Confess Sin. And I got six billion possible sites to visit. Now, most of what I saw, I, you know, I will admit, I will confess, I did not visit all six billion sites, uh, not even six million of them. <laughs> but as I surfed around, uh, what I saw in those few minutes had to do with penance and priests and religion and self-improvement and rituals. I also found a large number of online systems for gathering confessions from people who log on. It's true. You can now confess your sins online. And words like anonymous and convenient were found all over the place. There were sites, there are, not just were, but there are sites where you can visit an online confessional portal. And after confessing your sin, you can use your credit card to make a charitable contribution as well. It seems that the issue of how to confess your sin and get rid of guilt is a universal dilemma. Evidently, sin and feelings of guilt are not just Victorian hangovers from the past that we all need to just get over. But again, when I typed how to confess sin, I did not just get 6,000 possible sites to visit or even 6 million, but I got 6 billion. Now, Jesus is going to handle this issue with just four words. Like I said, we're continuing our examination of the disciples' prayer found in the Gospel of Luke chapter 11. And we're now at verse 4. As Philip Keller wrote in his book on this prayer, these four words might be the most important words you will ever learn how to pray. Very possibly, these four words might be the most important words you will ever learn how to pray. Well, as we jump into this, I, I want us to get a running start today. Because the Lord has just taught his disciples how to pray for daily bread. Praying for daily bread battled their sense, and, and it battles ours as well, of arrogance and, and independence. Praying for bread leads us to gratitude and a sense of awe that God has created heaven and earth to produce even the bread that we need to survive. This same sense of humility is required on the next request. And verse 4 simply states, Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Now, we're going to explore that latter phrase next week because it is most often misunderstood. But for now, let me say at least that Jesus is not teaching his disciples that they must earn forgiveness by forgiving other people. No, Jesus is teaching them that forgiven people should be forgiving people. And there will be a whole lot more on that next Sunday. But I want to make sure that we at least have that clear from the get-go. That he's not saying that you have to earn your forgiveness by forgiving others. Or that if you don't forgive others, that you won't be forgiven. 
that that's not it. But that as we are forgiven people, we should be forgiving others. Like I said, more next week on that. For today, here are the four life-changing words. Forgive us our sin. Other translations read, forgive us, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Or as we pray and other translations have, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. One four-year-old little girl said it wrong, but got the right idea when she was being taught this prayer. And trespasses was not in her vocabulary. And so this little girl said, and forgive us our trash baskets as we forgive those who put trash in our baskets. <laughs> now that may not be what scripture says, but boy, she got it right. Well, in order to understand these four words correctly, we need to recognize again to whom Jesus is teaching this model prayer. If you've been with us through the series, you know that Jesus is teaching his disciples this prayer. And the prayer began with our Father. The Lord is not teaching unbelievers to pray this prayer. In this context, this isn't a prayer to be brought into the family of God. This is a prayer for those who already belong to the family of God. And although these words could be part of an unbeliever's prayer in coming to faith in Christ, here in this context, this is not a prayer for spiritual salvation. This is a prayer for spiritual communion. This is not being written to people who want to become children of God. This is being written to those who already are children of God. Remember, they are praying to their Father who is in heaven. And this prayer request is for daily cleansing, daily forgiveness. Warren Wearsby points out in his commentary on this text that forgiveness in the Bible has a couple different aspects to it. First of all, there is ultimate, complete forgiveness. That is what an unbeliever receives when they accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. He forgives all of their sins comprehensively, past, present, and future. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. All of it. Not just part of it. All of it. Every one of your sins, past, present, and and still future, has already been nailed to the cross. He has already seen it all. That list of debts, that long list of sins, every single one was canceled out on the cross. This is the atoning work of Christ as our substitute on that cross. He became saturated with our sins and the sins of all of humanity over the course of human history. For the believer, the forgiveness that we experience by virtue of his sacrifice is experienced once and for all. The entirety of our sins is canceled out at the cross. At the cross. Not crossed, but cross. Now, you might even be asking, well, how many sins were there? more than we could ever begin to recognize or even remember to individually confess. J.I. Packer points out in his commentary on this text that the Anglican Church rightly defines sin in two categories, sins of commission and sins of omission. Sins of commission are willful acts and thoughts that violate the word and character of God. Whereas sins of omission are leaving undone the things which we ought to have done. Or leaving unsaid things that we shouldn't have done. 
And this is right out of James chapter 4, verse 17, which says, Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. So sin is both doing something you shouldn't do and not doing something that you should do. Now, I want you to suppose with me just to kind of bring this uh, a little bit more context and home. Now, suppose that I, Pastor Ryan, commit 10 sins a day by omission and commission. Maybe, maybe I don't act kindly. Maybe I respond self-centeredly. Uh, maybe I speed on the highway, breaking the law. Maybe I don't tip graciously. Or I want something that someone else has. Or I fail to be grateful. Maybe I put off something that I should do. And all of that can happen even before lunch. Ten sins of commission and omission per day. But think about it. If I only committed ten sins per day, I would commit 3,650 sins per year. Now, we average about 30 adults here in worship every week at Quincy Community Church. So, if your day is like mine, then together, this congregation would be responsible for committing almost 110,000 sins this year. Now, our little church, 110,000 sins. Just our church. Now, maybe you're sitting there thinking, no, Pastor Ryan, we're not that sinful. Come on. All right, so let's, let's go with that. How about three sins per day? That would be amazing. But it still would be about 33,000 sins per year committed by us. Just us. And those are actually only the sins that we realize we're committing. That's actually what David meant when he wrote in Psalm 19, verse 12, Who can discern all his errors? The expected answer is nobody. Nobody except God. And that's why when we come to Christ for salvation, we are offered ultimate and final and categorical forgiveness. Because we can't even remember or begin to confess every single one of our sins. That right there was actually the conundrum of Martin Luther, the reformer. When Luther entered the monastery, he was determined to pay any price necessary to arrive at a right standing with God. In fact, he nearly drove his religious mentors crazy by his long confessions. One day, he confessed for nearly six hours until his confessor became too exhausted to hear any more as Luther tried to rid his conscience of guilt. Conscience of guilt. And finally, after seven years, his confessor put an end to the torment and ordered Luther to leave the monastery and begin teaching at the University of Wittenberg. Well, he moved into a monastery near the university and began to teach. And by the providence of God, Martin Luther decided to teach the book of Romans and Galatians. And as he taught and preached in the cathedral through these books of the Bible, the doctrine of justification by faith alone eventually chased him down. He was shaken by the truth of Paul's letter to the Romans in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, which says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it, as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Luther would later write, Although I was an impeccable monk, I stood before God as a sinner, without any confidence that my merit would satisfy God. 
And through his study of the scriptures, Luther came to realize that a person was made righteous, which does not mean perfect. It simply means right with God. That a person was made righteous not by self-denial or self-sacrifice or self-earning merit, but by faith alone in Christ alone and the work that Christ did. The church at the time was not teaching this, but the Bible was. Well, Martin Luther's life and world was changed by that discovery. He risked his life and his future to preach what he referred to as sola scriptura, the scripture alone. His prayer life also changed. He wrote to his friend Peter the barber, you cannot even remember every sin you commit. So trust in the forgiveness of Christ. Luther was freed from guilt by trusting Christ's work on his behalf to finally, ultimately, and completely forgive his sins, past, present, and future. Now, maybe some of you are thinking, sitting there thinking, well, if God has already forgiven my past, my present and my future sins, then why not just sin and not worry about it? Why deal with all this guilt and all this shame and all this other stuff? In fact, when the Apostle Paul taught this theological truth of ultimate and comprehensive forgiveness, that's exactly what the Jewish leaders criticized. They effectively said, Paul, you're giving the people a free pass to sin. If there's a mountain of grace, then people will commit a mountain of sin. To which Paul responded in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. No, not at all. A believer does not want to abuse the grace of God but wants to apply the grace of God to their heart and their life. But again, if we are completely forgiven, finally and comprehensively at our salvation, then why is Jesus teaching us to pray, forgive us our sins? If they're already forgiven, then why pray that? Why is Jesus telling us to do that? Well, the answer to that question is because there's another aspect to forgiveness that impacts a believer's life. Forgiveness isn't just final, but it's daily. It's not just final, it's daily. These four words here are not related to salvation. They are related to fellowship. This is a prayer for believers. This is not the prayer to Forgive us our sins so that we can come into a relationship with you. But this is forgive us our sins so that we can restore the relationship we have with you. When you sin, and this prayer assumes that you will sin, you don't have to become saved all over again. It's not like when you sin, you lose your salvation. I want to make that clear. No. You don't. Nothing can take you out of the hands of God when you belong to him. You cannot lose your salvation, but you can lose your fellowship. When you sin, your status in life doesn't change, but your satisfaction in life does. Think about it this way. I've been married now for almost 18 years. And let's say, let's suppose that I do something that is unkind to Christiana. Now, that's actually not something that you have to imagine because it has happened more than once or twice. My kids can attest to that. But let's suppose as well that I tell her I'm sorry and she forgives me. We don't have to get married all over again because the status of our relationship didn't change. But the spirit of our relationship had changed. Or, to use another analogy, consider your child disobeying you over 
and over again until you finally say, that does it. However, they don't stop being your child. No matter what they do, they are still your child. They need to apologize, not so that they can rejoin your family and become your child again, but so that they can enjoy the relationship of being part of your family again. It's that relationship that is hindered. And these four words constitute the prayer of a prodigal child, a prodigal disciple. And frankly, we are all prodigals every single day. Throughout the day, we return again and again to these wonderful words, forgive us our sins. And these four words are actually based on two conditions. First, that you're willing to agree that God is right. That you're willing to agree that God is right. You did something that he says not to do in his word. And his word is always right. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what everybody else says. True confession begins with an agreement in your heart that God is right. And the second condition is being, being willing to admit that you were wrong. Not only that God is right, but being willing to admit that you were wrong. Forgive us our sins, not our reasons. God has not ever once forgiven an excuse. He forgives sin. He forgives sinners. If you are a sinner, then you qualify to pray this prayer. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This text is written to Christians. And the word John, the apostle uses for confess, is a word that means to say the same thing. In other words, you're saying the same thing about what you're doing or thinking that God says about it. You are agreeing with God. You're confessing that he was right and you were wrong. And you stop putting words in his mouth that justify your sin. Too often, we attempt to get God on our side for the smallest of sins as well as the greatest offenses. And we learn how to do that early in life. Like the little girl I read about this week, her parents gave her a golden retriever for her fifth birthday. And it wasn't long before she was telling all of her neighbors and friends that she had been given her very own pet lion. You can't tell the difference, she insisted. It's my pet lion. Well, her mother found out and brought her inside and said, I've told you plenty of times not to lie. Now I want you to go upstairs to your bedroom and I want you to tell God that you're sorry. And so the little girl moped her way upstairs. And a little while later, she came hopping and skipping back downstairs with a smile on her face. And her mother asked, did you confess to God that what you said was wrong? And she replied, yes, ma'am, I did. And God told me that sometimes he can't tell the difference either. <laughs> That's not quite exactly genuine confession that we're talking about. <coughs> And let me quickly reinforce this study today by pointing out three opportunities that this prayer can offer us. First of all, this is a daily opportunity to remind ourselves that our sin does not bring us fulfillment after all. Secondly, it's a daily opportunity to rejoice that Christ paid the debt for our sin and loves us in spite of it all. And third, this is a daily opportunity to return to God in fellowship, not because we are worthy, but because we are welcomed. Dr. Harry Ironside, a beloved Bible teacher and a former pastor of Moody Church, 
repeated an account from history that illustrates the payment of debt by another. Many years ago, Tsar Nicholas I of Russia had a good friend whose son was in the army. Out of kindness, the Tsar had appointed or had assigned him to border fortress of the Russian army and appointed over the payroll for that entire army. The young man started well, but he began gambling and eventually gambled away not only his own paycheck, but the money from government funds to be used for the upcoming payroll of the garrison of soldiers. He unexpectedly received notice that an official from the palace would be coming to perform an audit of the books. The young man knew that he was in serious trouble. The night before the official was to arrive, he took out the ledger to find out how much money had been given from the government to cover the payroll. He totaled the amount. Then he went to the safe and took out the money that was on hand and counted it carefully. The difference was large, too large to ever explain away. Well, as he sat there looking at the final figures, this young officer picked up his pen and wrote in large letters on the bottom page of the ledger, a great, a great debt, who can pay? Then, because he did not see how he could face his father or the terrible shame and dishonor the next day held for him, he decided to take his life with his own revolver at the stroke of midnight. Well, that night, the air was warm, and he became drowsy at his accounting desk. As he waited for the midnight hour, despite himself, this young man's head dropped lower and lower until he fell asleep. His head resting next to the ledger on one side, his pistol still in his hand on the other side. Tsar Nicholas I was often in the habit of putting on the uniform of a common soldier and visiting the troops to see how they were getting along. He did that this very night. Eventually, coming around to the payroll office, he saw the young man whom he recognized fast asleep. He walked over to the desk and saw the books and the money stacked in rows on the desk. He read the total amount in the ledger and saw the pistol in the young man's hand, and immediately the issue became clear. His first thought was to awaken the young man and place him under arrest, and then to have him court-martialed. But then he happened to notice the personal note written at the bottom of the ledger. A great debt who can pay he was strangely overwhelmed with mercy and grace Tsar Nicholas the first quietly leaned over picked up the pen that had fallen from the hand of the sleeping officer wrote one word and then tiptoed out at the break of dawn this young man suddenly awoke and realized that he had fallen asleep as there was not much time to lose, he reached for his revolver, but as he did so, something caught his eye. Something underneath his note that he had written in despair, a great debt, who can pay? And underneath that was written one word, Nicholas. Dropping his gun, he, he raced to the files where the signature of the czar was available. They were from the same hand. He thought to himself, The czar has been here tonight and knows all my guilt. But he has chosen to pay my debt for me. Just then, a messenger arrived from the palace carrying a purse that contained the exact amount of money needed to satisfy the debt. made me think, and I ask you, have you ever thought about the fact that Jesus was teaching his disciples and us to pray these four words, all the while knowing that the basis for our ability to pray it would be his death, his sacrifice, his suffering, and his payment on our behalf. 
he has written on the ledger of our sinful lives, not just once, but daily, underneath our daily recognition of this fact, we have a debt too high, who can pay? And he writes his name. So, do you need to confess your sins, be forgiven, and cleansed? There are six billion sites that will attempt to tell you what to do to accomplish this. But let me tell you, all you really need are these four words and a signature. Four words. Forgive us our sins and his signature. Amen. If you would go ahead and stand, we will have our closing worship song and then our benediction. Thank you.
And now receive today's benediction, which comes from Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.